Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the latest installment of the HDSA Research Webinar Series. Um, this is George Orling from HDSA. And uh, I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your days to um, hear the latest webinar, which we're really happy to say that we've got uh, Dr. Elizabeth Thomas, Beth Thomas, from the Scripps Research Institute uh, with us today. And she's going to be speaking about a really um, interesting target um, or approach to potentially uh, design drugs around to uh, improve symptoms and with uh, symptoms of Huntington's disease called histone deacetylase or HDAC. Um, but before we get started, and for any of those out there that are new to the webinar series, I just wanted to um, let you know that you can ask questions at any point during. Beth's presentation. Just go into the questions box on the right-hand side menu of of your screen. Um, it's highlighted here on this slide. You can type your presentation and click send. And at the end of Beth's talk, um, we'll ask those questions on your behalf. Um, for those who maybe have to dial off or were unable to join or you think other family members um, would be interested in watching this, we're recording this. And, and we'll archive it on our website shown here at hgsa.org backslash or forward slash research webinar. Uh, and just finally, for next month, we're, uh, we have another speaker lined up for April 16th. We'll be hearing from Dr. Francesca Cicchetti. She's at the University of Laval in Quebec, where she'll be speaking to us about uh, the title of her presentation is on the spread of mutant Huntington protein from cell to cell and this implications of this for transplant therapies, stem cell transplant therapies for Huntington's. And finally, if you have any ideas or suggestions for research topics that you'd really like to know more about, just email them to us at researchupdates at hdsa.org. So before I turn it over to our speaker, I just want to take a moment to introduce Beth. Uh, Dr. Thomas is an associate professor in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Neuroscience at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, California. Beth received her bachelor's degree in biochemistry from the University of California, Berkeley, and a PhD from the Department of Pharmacology at uh, University of California, Irvine. Uh, her research in her lab focuses on uh, understanding the molecular and epigenetic mechanisms of neurodegenerative and psychiatric disorders like Huntington's disease. And, um, we'll be hearing, you'll be hearing a lot more about her exciting work in the field of uh, targeting HDACs or HD. So I'm going to turn it over to, change the presenter over to you, Beth, and you will okay. have the floor. Great. Okay, oops, let me put my opening screen up. All right. There we go. Thank you, George. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this series. This is really a pleasure to be here and to tell everyone about our HDAC inhibitor program at Scripps. So for about the past 10 years or so, my lab has been investigating the potential use for selective histone deacetylase, or HDAC inhibitors, as a potential therapeutic for Huntington's disease. And today, I will tell you about Beth? these selective compounds. Yes? Beth, I'm sorry. We, right now, I just, we just see a black screen. Really? Uh-oh, what did I do? Um, um, you click share my screen. I hit share my screen. What how about that? Let's try again. I'll take it back. Okay. And now I'm going to give it back to you. Okay. So do I click show my screen? Yes. Okay. Did that work? Still black. Really? What about that? Nothing. We just. Oh, maybe it's us. Everyone's telling works for you. Everyone else is seeing the slides, so it's <laughs> apparently just us. Okay. Well, if it, it's a problem, please let me know so I'm not uh, looking at a black or talking about something that everyone is not seeing. So, are we okay to go on? It's all about the the people dialing in. So as long as they can see the slides, <laughs> um, okay. I'll just. Make them up in my head. Okay, well, great. 
So um, as I said, today I wanted to tell you about our compounds and how they're working. And to do so, I, I thought it would first be, oops, I think I lost control now of my, oops, sorry. of my, okay. I thought I would first tell you a little bit of background on chromatin and gene expression to order, in, order, in order for you to understand how these compounds are working and also to provide a rationale for the use of these compounds in Huntington's disease. And then we'll talk about our compounds, which are the selective inhibitors and their effects on different HD phenotypes. And most of the systems we use are mouse models. And then I'll end with some information on clinical trials with broadly acting HDEC inhibitors and uh, potentially future trials for Huntington's disease. Okay, so let's start with a little bit of background on chromosomes, DNA, and gene expression. So in humans, we have 46 chromosomes that carry all of our genetic information. And this is in the form of DNA. Now there's actually six feet of DNA in every nucleus and every cell in your body. So imagine that for a minute, six feet of DNA. So in order for all of that to fit, it has to be very efficiently packaged. And to do this, the cell uses histones. So I'm going to hopefully see my arrow. Yes. So DNA is packaged around these yellow proteins called histones and to form chromatin. And then the chromatin is further condensed into what we call chromosomes. However, for DNA information to be read, it has to be open and unwound. So you might imagine a ball of yarn. And if you wanted to knit a sweater, you'd have to unwind the yarn from the ball in order to knit the sweater. So similarly, in order for the DNA to be read, it has to be unwound from these histone proteins to be in a manner which allows regulatory proteins to bind to the DNA, read the DNA, make RNA, and then make protein. So one way the cell does this is by acetylation of histones. So here we're looking at chromatin again in a different cartoon. And um, what we see here is a cell group. So this is just a two-carbon moiety that is attached to the histones. And when the histones are acetylated, they're charged and they become relaxed or they don't like to stick together as much. And when the chromatin and DNA are in this form, this facilitates gene expression. So we have increased gene expression. Alternatively, when the histones are not acetylated, this allows the chromatin to be tightly packed into condensed chromatin, and that represses or results in decreased gene expression. Now, histone acetylation and deacetylation are modulated by the interplay of two opposing enzymes called histone acetyltransferases, or HATs, and histone deacetylases, or HDACs. So the HATs add the acetyl group to the chromatin, facilitate gene expression, while HDACs remove the acetyl group, leading to decreased gene expression. So another way we can increase gene expression is with HDAC inhibitors. So these inhibitors would bind to the HDACs to prevent the deacetylation of the histones, and what the result is is increased gene expression. Okay, so why is that important? Let's look at the big picture. So at the DNA level, it, it's very important to have proper regulation of gene expression. So for example, if there's a DNA mutation or the presence of a diseased protein, for example, this can cause a change in gene expression at the molecular level. That in turn causes changes at the cellular level, such as abnormalities in cell function and neurons. When that happens, that feeds into the systems level. So we result in disrupted connectivity or information processing in the brain, and certainly this leads to motor and cognitive symptoms at the behavioral level. And as it turns out, in Huntington's disease, there is a problem at the DNA level with ex gene expression. So I wanted to throw this slide on there first to remind you that Huntington's disease is actually a part of a big family of triple repeat disorders. And there are more than 20 of these disorders known to be caused by expansions of an unstable trinucleotide repeat. So in the case of Huntington's disease, it's a CAG repeat in a region of the gene called an exon, which means it gets transcribed and translated into a protein. It turns out there are several other CAG repeat disorders that are also listed on the slide. And what I'm about to tell you about transcriptional dysregulation in Huntington's disease also applies to other polyglutamine diseases. I also wanted to show this slide to bring up Friedrich's ataxia because I will mention this disease at the end. This is caused by a different triplet repeat expansion. It's a GAA repeat, which is an intron. And this results also in gene repression. And it turns out that HDAC inhibitors are also useful for this disorder, which, again, I'll mention at the end. So let's look specifically, again, at Huntington's disease. We have our CAG repeat 
of, let's say, 40 in our exon. That becomes transcribed into RNA and then translated into a protein that has an expanded polyglutamine region, which results in protein aggregation. So these aggregated proteins are found not only in human brains, but also in mouse models. And what they can do is really mess up gene expression. So in this cartoon, this summarizes some of the effects that mutant Huntington aggregates can have on gene expression. And really, a landmark finding in this field came nearly 15 years ago by Joan Stefan and Leslie Thompson from UC Irvine, and where they found that mutant Huntington aggregates could bind to this protein CDP, which was a HAT, it's a histone acetyl transferase enzyme. And that resulted in decreased acetylation of histones in cells, and later this founding was reproduced in mouse models. And this was found at not only specific gene loci, but on a global level. So there was a global level of low acetylation. Another way that mutant Huntington can mess up transcription is by binding transcription factors, such as TBP, P53, SP1. So this cartoon shows a big aggregate binding and sequestering these important regulatory proteins that all of a sudden don't work anymore and cause repression of transcription. Mutant Huntington can also directly bind to the DNA via its polyglutamine domain or via other mechanisms, and again, also cause decreased expression. So abnormal regulation based on all these different mechanisms leads to basically decreased abnormal gene expression. And what this panel or this figure on the right shows is a list of some of the top concordantly dysregulated genes in human, which is shown in the very far right, compared to different mouse models. And what you're looking at is a green is a decreased expression change, and a red is an increased change. And actually, there's no red on this figure because it's all green. So most of the early changes, and these I should mention are changes that occur early in disease, they are decreases in gene expression, so repression, gene repression. And um, given that there's so much evidence regarding dysregulation of transcription at the regulatory level and gene expression level, really it's been widely accepted now that gene expression dysregulation really represents a core pathogenic mechanism in disease. So we know Huntington's disease is associated with a wide range of gene expression abnormalities, such as the ones I showed you on the previous slide. So that led to the idea that new targets for drug treatment could correct the faulty transcription. And this is where histone deacetylase or HDAC inhibitors come in. So some of you may have heard of HDAC inhibitors. It turns out that they've been proposed for use in a wide range of neurological disorders besides Huntington's disease. And some of these are listed on the slide I have shown. They were initially developed as anti-tumor agents for cancer. And it turns out that there are many clinical trials going on right now for cancer. But we don't think that the reason that they're useful in cancer is the same reason why they might be beneficial to patients with neurological disorders such as Huntington's disease. A real major breakthrough in the application of these compounds for neurological disorders came with the identification of subtype selective compounds, which I will tell you about today. So first, I wanted just to briefly review three major papers that happened about 10 years ago, which used broadly acting HDAC inhibitors in rodent models of HD. These studies use SAHA, sodium butyrate, and phenylbutyrate. And these are broadly acting non-selective compounds that were found to improve HD phenotypes or symptoms in mouse models, but the problem was they had toxic effects. The mice lost weight and didn't feel very good and became sick. And that's because we have to consider that the HDAC family is actually a very large family. There are 18 different HDACs identified in humans, and they've been divided into four different classes. Three of the classes are shown here. There's class one, which is HDAC one, two, three, and eight. Class 2 HDACs are HDAC 4, 5, 6, 7, 9A and B, and 10. There's a class 3 HDACs, which are called the sirtuins, and these, are, these work in a different manner, so I'm not grouping them in with what are referred to as the classical HDACs. And then there's a single lone member of class 4, which is HDAC 11. So as it turns out, in the, in the past five years or so, many different researchers have found that these individual HDACs can actually play different roles in the brain. When you overexpress some of them, they can be toxic or they can be neuroprotective. 
So then it becomes clear that you wouldn't want to inhibit the entire class of HDACs for a therapeutic because you'd be possibly inhibiting neurotoxic effects, which would be good. At the same time, you might be inhibiting neuroprotective effects, which would be bad. I also want to point out on this slide that there's another HDAC, which I'm not going to talk about today, which is HDAC4. And there are studies by Jill Bates from London who have implicated HDAC4 as being a useful target for Huntington's disease. However, the HDAC4 inhibitors that have been developed to date haven't been that useful in mouse models. Um, nonetheless, it's still a focus of some researchers looking at this particular isoform of HDACs. The two that I want to point out specifically are HDAC1 and HDAC3. So some of these studies that are shown, there's many other ones that have been done as well, have actually indicated that HDAC1 and HDAC3 are specifically neurotoxic in the brain. So the first paper that came out showed that HDAC1 could cause axonal damage. Studies by a colleague of mine, Santosh Mello, found that if you overexpress HDAC3 in neurons, you would, you would kill them. And then interestingly, they also showed that HDAC1 and HDAC3 could interact with one another and act as sort of a molecular switch, because some studies in the past have shown that HDAC1 was actually neuroprotective. So in our studies, we measured a handful of these HDACs in mouse brain, and what we found using Western blot, this is a panel, um, the figure shown on the left, and the quantification of the Western blot on the right, we found that actually HDACs 1 and 3 were elevated in the brains of a transgenic mouse model called the N17182Q mouse model. Don't worry so much about that. Um, whereas HDAC2 and HDAC4 were really not significantly changed. So this suggests that HDAC1 and 3 could be responsible for some of the transcriptional abnormalities that have been observed in these brains. Now, in completely different studies, sort of jump out parallel in parallel studies back in 2006, a colleague of mine, Joel Gottesfeld at the Scripps Research Institute, was investigating a novel group of HTAC inhibitors for use in Friedrich's ataxia. Now, I'll mention this again at the end, but Friedrich's ataxia is caused by a repression in the gene called Fertaxin. So what you see on this slide is a bunch of different compounds from his initial library and their ability to elevate, the full change increase in their ability to elevate Fertaxin gene expression. So what has since been done is these compounds, they all look a kind of alike, but you can see that there's tiny modifications that have been made in order to sort of improve selectivity and brain permeability. And what the most exciting part of these compounds were was that they were not toxic. So these HDAC inhibitors showed low toxicity. So they did not inhibit cell proliferation and they did not cause apoptosis. These are two effects that make these compounds useful for cancer. So in cancer, we want to cause apoptosis and kill cells. We certainly don't want that for neurological disorders. So this was a major breakthrough. And as it turns out, these novel compounds preferentially inhibit HDAC1 and 3 or just HDAC3. So in this table, it just shows a handful of the compounds that we put into mouse models and their profiles. So you don't need to worry too much about the details, but what I want to show you is that they can only inhibit HDAC1 or 3, sometimes 2, they don't appreciably inhibit HDACs 4, 5, or 7, and they show low toxicity as indicated by the high number you see here for their ability to prevent cells from dividing. Now, these compounds have been licensed for clinical development by a company called Peplogen Corporation out of Waltham, Massachusetts. And um, they actually have been since, the rights of these compounds have actually been since transferred to a company called BioMarin, who we are working with now, and they are located in Marin, California. So there's more to come on that information. But what we initially had done with Refligen was decided to see if these compounds could work for Huntington's disease. So this slide shows a pipeline for our screening methods for these novel compounds in Huntington's disease. We started out with about 100, but many more hundreds of these compounds have actually been made. And the first round of screening took place in very easy to screen models there's a cell culture model we use and a Drosophila model. And I'll show you a little bit of data from those two systems. And these are very useful because you can screen a large number of compounds at one time. You can't really screen 100 compounds in mice. That would take a long time and, and it'd be a lot of work. So we initially screened them in two different easier systems to decide which ones would go into mice. And then at the same time, Replogen was testing the compounds for pharmacokinetics, cell permeability, 
metabolic stability, receptor cross-reactivity, et cetera, et cetera, things that you need to know before you go into the clinic. And the goal of these studies, which were funded by the NIH, was really to, adapt, to put forth one candidate for an investigational new drug. Okay, so just briefly, I'll show you an example of some of the cell culture studies. We can use striatal cells in culture that have been developed from a mouse that had a CAG expansion knocked into its own Huntington's disease gene. And these cells actually have a metabolic deficit that we find can be improved with our compounds. So here's a compound 4B, 136, 120, uh, 1029, and 991. In each case, you can see as we increase the concentration of the drug, we can improve the metabolism of these cells. So again, about 100 compounds went through this screen. Now, we also put these compounds in flies. These were done by Larry Marsh at UC Irvine. And as it turns out, the fly is actually a very good model for Huntington's disease. And that is because it exhibits an eye neurodegeneration phenotype, which can be induced by overexpressing a polyglutamine stretch of 108 glutamines. And again, you can feed these flies with different compounds, which are shown on the right and you can see an improvement in the degeneration, or rather a prevention of the neurodegeneration of the fly eye. So after these two screens were done, we tested these compounds in mouse models. And I wanted to just mention a word about HD mouse models before I show you some of our data. And that is, at first we know that there are a number of different neuropsychiatric features that can precede the motor problems in Huntington's disease. And these are sometimes difficult to measure in a mouse because can you always tell how a mouse feels? Well, not really. Happy, tired, anxious, worried. One of the good news, one of the pieces of good news in this area is that HTAC inhibitors could also be useful in treating these psychiatric features. And that is because one compound called valproic acid is actually used, widely used for bipolar disorder. And I'm going to mention that again at the end. Now, the good news on the mouse model front is that we are able to measure motor dysfunction and movement problems very well. So there have been many different mouse models made. They often express different pieces of the human Huntington's disease gene with different CAG expansion repeats, or they can have a mutation knocked into the mouse's own Huntington's disease gene. But pretty much all these models exhibit some form of just motor dysfunction or incoordination. One thing we can measure are gait disturbances. So this is an example of a mouse who's had his front and back paws painted different colors. You can see a wild-type mouse has a very ordered pattern when it runs along a straight line, whereas a mouse called the R62 mouse, which was actually the first Huntington's disease mouse model to be developed, has a very disordered, disordered or discoordination in its running. We, all we also widely use a test called the rotor rod, which measure measures how long a mouse can stay on a moving rod. This is not unlike the log rolling contest, where you can see men running on a log, and this guy here is certainly determined to fall into the water. Now, we don't have water under there, but we do have a nice padded surface for the mice so they don't hurt themselves. And another simple test that we can run is just looking at their activity in the open field. So they are allowed to run around a chamber, and these bottom traces show the mouse's automated behavior, so a more active mouse will run all over where you can clearly see that a Huntington's disease mouse is less active and you can quantify this quite easily. Okay, so the goals of our mouse studies were first to test the efficacy of these novel selective inhibitors and in different mouse models. And I will add here that it is very important to use different mouse models when looking at preclinical studies for Huntington's disease. And that is because in previous studies where only one mouse model was used, many compounds that seem to work pretty well in mice end up failing in humans, such as Cohen's MQ and some of the other um, creatinine trials that worked well in one mouse model but not when it went to humans. So nowadays the NIH, the government, is demanding that all preclinical studies be conducted in at least two mouse models. So we've actually been using three different mouse models in our studies, and I'll show you some data from two of those. And then we really wanted to ask the question of a selectivity. So we wanted to compare the effects of HDAC1 and 3 targeting compounds. And one of the drugs that we've used most for our studies is a drug called 4B. It's a very nice tool to measure inhibition of HDAC1 and 3. And then we wanted to compare that to an inhibitor that would be selectively targeting HDAC3. 
And that, again, was to tease out the most selective HDAC for therapeutics because, again, we don't want to inhibit more HDACs than we have to, and this would decrease our chances of having a toxic effect. Okay, so here's some data. First of all, this is data from the rotor rod, which again you see in the lower right, the lower left panel. And what we're looking at are wild type mice. These are normal mice. So in yellow and green, and the color scheme is the same for all the next four slides. The wild type mice are in yellow and green with the drug treated in green. And the transgenic vehicle mouse, so that is either an R62 mouse or an N171 mouse that has been given a vehicle, which is the same solution that the drug was made up in and then the red will show the drug effect. And what we're looking here at, at here is latency to fall on the y-axis and then the different trials. And what we can see is that both 4B and a compound called 966, which is HDAC3 specific, can improve the performance of the mice. So we're looking at the red line being higher than the blue line. And in the case of the HDAC3 targeting compound, we see that the red line is nearly as high as, as the wild type mice, which is very good. We also can look at body weight, and it turns out that many models of Huntington's disease in mice lose weight just like humans do, and this can be a progressive loss, which can lead to death. And um, in this particular study, although previous studies using 4B, we did see an effect on body weight. This three-peak study we, we did found that HDAC, the one free compound, did not prevent the body weight loss. However, the 966 HDAC3 compound actually did prevent prevent the loss of body weight. So again, we're looking at the red line being above the blue line and we're measuring the body weight. We also did this differently in males and females, and that is because the females seem to have a greater effect. So we have to separate the sexes for all of these types of um, body weight studies. Now here is some data from the open field, and I know it looks really busy, so I just wanted you to focus maybe on a couple of different measures. So the open field, can measure a lot of different things. We can measure how far the mouse travels, how fast the mouse travels, if the mouse rears, if the mouse stops and does uh, repeated stereotypic movements. And again, we're comparing the 4B HDAC13 targeting compound to the 966 compound. And just looking at this one here, looking at vertical time. So this is the amount of time the mouse spends on its rear paws. And comparing blue and red, we see that the drug-treated mouse really almost is indistinguishable. Well, you can see a slight difference from the wild-type mouse, but a greatly improved function from the vehicle mouse. And looking at down here at 966, we can look at ambulatory distance. And again, we see the red line being much higher than the blue line. So in terms of the distance traveled by the mouse, the drug can improve that. We also want to look at the brains of these mice to see if there's any noticeable neuroprotective effects. So at the end of the drug treatment, the mice, uh, we take the brains out and we cut them in a coronal manner, and we can measure simply the stridal volume. So while mice, at least most of the mouse models, don't get overt neurodegeneration, they do get a brain shrinkage. And you can see this in the lower panel here. When you compare a wild-type mouse, this is a stridum, and the stridum, as many of you probably know, is a region of the brain that controls movement. And it's the one that's most primarily degenerated in Huntington's disease patients, although the cortex is also, of course, affected. And what you can see here is that the R62 mouse, which is one of our HD transgenic mice, have a smaller stridum than the wild type mouse. This is also manifested as a larger ventricle, which is just the space where the cerebral spinal fluid is. So quantifying this measure, we can see that both of our compounds can increase or prevent this shrinkage of the stridum. Okay, so we, um, we were really happy with a lot of our data. We tested probably up to 20 different compounds in our mouse models, and most of them show some effect, although we had several that showed very, very good effects. And um, that, was, that was great. But then we wanted to go on and ask, besides altering gene expression, which we know is happening, we want to know exactly what are the targets of these compounds. How exactly are they working? Or what genes and pathways are being affected by these compounds? And to do this, we're using a technique called microarray analysis. And this is what's shown on the screen. There are little chips. The size here is probably the actual size of what it looks like, maybe a couple inches, a couple inches tall and one and a half inches thick. And what these chips are are little pieces of DNA that have been bound to the chip 
and it allows us to screen expression of thousands of genes at one time. And we've done this in different regions of the brain of the transgenic mice and also in muscle tissue. And I'm not going to go into all the data today, but I do want to tell you a little bit of what we found. First, what we found, which is very interesting, was that we found subsets of changes that were normalized by HDAC for treatment. So what this figure shows you is what's called a heat map. And again, the green is a decreased expression. This actually does have red in it. It's an increased expression from the striatum. And what we want to compare are this group of genes right here. So these green genes were decreased in the transgenic mouse before treatment, and they became elevated after treatment. You will also notice there are changes that were red that turned green, and we think these are more secondary changes resulting as a um, consequence of a, a decrease in gene expression. Now I just want to tell you about one pathway that we are focusing on that we think these compounds could be acting on and that is the ubiquitin proteasomal system for protein turnover in the brain. So there are actually two major pathways for protein turnover in the CNS, and that's the ubiquitin proteasomal pathway and the autophagy pathway. And these pathways are essential for eliminating the solid proteins. It turns out that these pathways are, have been shown to be defective in Huntington's disease mice, and um, that might be one reason why the Huntington protein is allowed to misfold and aggregate is because it doesn't have a properly function, functioning UPS or autophagy systems. This is just a cartoon showing you what the system looks like. This substrate here could be considered the mutant Huntington protein. When it misfolds, it gets targeted by this ubiquitin moiety, which is shown in pink. And once in a series of ubiquitin moieties are attached to the protein, it's targeted to the proteasome, and then it becomes degraded. So in our microarray studies, we found that one of the top pathways that was altered due to drug treatment were genes in this pathway. This pathway contains probably up to 50 to 100 genes that are responsible for this process. So I'm not showing you the data, but what we found was that the genes were lowered in HD mice and our drugs could elevate the expression of these genes, but then we really wanted to ask if it was having a consequence. So we felt pretty confident that we were elevating the expression of these genes in the UPS pathway, but then we wanted to ask if it was really having an effect on the formation of Huntington aggregates. So this next slide shows some immunohistochemistry data from different brain regions of our mouse model. I think this is a M171 mouse model, and what you can see in the top three panels are a vehicle-treated mouse, a cortex, this is the piriform cortex, and the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, and you can see the aggregates, these nice round black dots. And what we can see is after treatment with 4B, these aggregates are reduced and they become smaller. And we quantify that in the bar graph at the bottom. Okay, and now I'm not going to go into detail about the other mechanisms or other ways that we think these compounds could be acting, but I've summarized it in this cartoon. And if you want to read more, you can I refer you to the review that I published last year. And so what we think is happening with these compounds, we have an HTAC inhibitor and they're targeting HDACs 1 and or 3. Just looking at the center pathway, it's showing you that picture of the acetylated histones again, where the HDAC inhibitors are promoting the elevation of histone acetylation to increase gene expression. And as I mentioned just in the past slide, we found that UPS-related genes were elevated and that this could target mutant Huntington for proteasomal degradation, leading to lower mutant Huntington levels. Well, it turns out we also know some other gene changes that are occurring as a result of treatment with these compounds, and these include elevation in UDNF and other pro-survival genes, and these can lead to neuroprotective effects. I might also add that many other studies besides those from our group have found that HTAC inhibitors can elevate BDNF. So this certainly is one pathway that could be useful and could be why these compounds are effective. We also found that they can elevate anti-inflammatory genes such as the COX genes, PTSD1, and this might be anti-inflammatory effects, which could also be beneficial to the brain. In studies that I haven't talked about, people have shown that HDAC1 inhibition can actually promote acetylation of mutant Huntington itself, which then would lead to autophagic degradation of the compound, again, ultimately leading to lower mutant Huntington levels. And then another, um, other, other studies I haven't addressed are the interaction between HDX1 and 3, which can lead to neuroprotective effects, and other acetylation of other cytokines, which would 
then lead to anti-inflammatory effects. So I don't want to get too bogged down with this, but um, I want to let you know that there are probably several different mechanisms for why these compounds could be acting. And it could be that they're acting differently according to the different diseases. Okay, now I just want to spend the last five or ten minutes talking about some clinical trials with HTAC inhibitors. And this is for non-cancer indications. So if you look up clinicaltrials.gov and HTAC inhibitors, most of the trials you'll find are for cancer. And that is because there are many, many trials happening with these non-selective, broadly acting compounds for cancer. There also are many compounds, or many uh, trials going on for neurological disorders. And I want to point out a few of them on this slide. First, I want to mention that bilperic acid, which was FDA approved in 1978 for epilepsy, has been widely used. It has a long and established history of use for bipolar disorder. And it wasn't actually identified as an HDAC inhibitor until 2001. But this compound is an HDAC inhibitor. And as I mentioned earlier about psychiatric symptoms that sometimes precede the motor effects, these types of HDAC inhibitors may also be useful for preventing those, those problems. Now, phenylbutyrate is another HDAC inhibitor that was approved in 1996 for urea cycle disorders. And there have been several trials that have used phenylbutyrate for Huntington's disease, spinal muscular atrophy, and ALS. And the final um, compound that's been used previously in clinical trials for non-cancer indications is Saha. This was approved in 2006 for cancer, and this is a highly potent cancer drug. So, uh, oh, finally, yes, I want to tell you just briefly about a trial with one of our compounds, which is called 109. This is an HDAC 1-3 selective compound that has been in the phase one trial for Friedrich's ataxia over in Italy, and I'll mention that in a minute. So first I want to talk about these trials. So there was actually a phase one clinical trial for phenylbutyrate in Huntington's disease, which is called FEND-HD. There are 60 patients, and they were given 15 grams a day for 20 weeks. And the results of this study really were that it was the first goal was to determine safety and tolerability, and that was a success. And then the secondary measures were looking at improved motor functions, and, and that did not show an improvement. And I have to say, I'll just sit through these because the same sorts of things happened in these other trials with phenylbutyrate and valproate. These compounds are FDA approved for other indications, and they're broadly acting compounds. These are not selective for any one or more individual HDAC enzymes. And basically, the results of these trials were all the same. These compounds were tolerated. They were safe. They actually were shown to elevate histoacylation in blood cells, but they didn't really help with symptoms. And one problem with these drugs is that they're very low potent. So high doses had to be used. This is 9 grams a day. 19 grams a day is a lot to use. And I think they really were afraid to go any higher for fear of toxic effects. These compounds, such as phenylbutyrate and sodium butyrate, valproate, are also rapidly degraded, and that is another reason why the high doses are required. So I wanted to tell you about a clinical trial with one of our compounds, 109, for Friedrich's ataxia. And to do that, I just briefly want to mention a little bit more about this disease. As I mentioned in the first slide I showed, this disease is called by an expansion of a GAA to a repeat, which is in the intron of the FXM gene. And this gene is called protaxin, and it's an essential mitochondrial protein. So this is not encoded. The GAA is not translated into a protein that has um, an altered protein function. But what happens with this gene is that these repeats can get up to 1,000, 1,000 GAA repeats. And that causes the DNA to fold on top of each other and form compact chromatin, which cannot, cannot be, the gene protaxin cannot be expressed. So it's autosomal recessive. It's progressive. It's actually the most common form of hereditary ataxia, affecting about 1 in 50,000 people in the U.S. And the main symptoms are muscle and coordination or ataxia. They also can have heart disease and cognitive dysfunction. Symptoms begin much earlier than in Huntington's disease, They're often appearing in, in children between the ages of 5 and 15. And they generally have about 10 to 20 years of, um, before they're con confined to a wheelchair. So just, I have just one data slide on Friedrichs, and that is showing that these compounds, the ones that were identified by Joel Gottesfeld, who's still working actively in this region, they're novel HDAC 13 targeting compounds, they were found to increase protaxin levels in patient lymphocytes. 
So here is um, a carrier and affected individuals, patient D, patient J, patient M. And when they treated these patients with the size of 4B, they could elevate the protection levels almost to the normal level. And they found with Western blot, they could see an increase in protein. So this was really the impetus for trying this compound in humans. And this trial that was completed just last year was done in Italy. It was a phase one trial with HDAC 109. And if you notice here, the much lower doses that were used, 30 to 120 milligrams per day. And if you wanted to compare that to the phenylbutyrate trials, which they were using on the order of 10 grams per day, it's much, much less. So certainly decreasing your chance of having abnormal side effects. And as it turns out, the 109 was well tolerated. There was no limiting toxicities. Um, this actually just said inc increased. So 109 actually increased HDAC activity in the patient blood cells and increased the uh, expression of the very important essential gene for taxin. So this was uh, very exciting. In the study, they didn't measure behavior or symptoms. They were just looking at the ability of this drug to be safe and tolerable as it had not been tested previously in any other patients and also if it could elevate the protection levels in the blood, which it did. Okay, so let's move back to Huntington's disease. So will these compounds lead to human therapeutics for HD? So as I mentioned, these compounds that were first licensed by Replogen have been tested for pharmacokinetics, cell permeability, metabolic stability, et cetera, et cetera. And since their transfer to Biomarin, there have been additional derivatives made. And basically, this is to improve the, um, the selectivity compared to the toxicity. And we already, there already were several compounds that had achieved this status, but really what Biomarin wanted to do was improve the brain penetration. So I'm going to show another table of compounds. So here along the left is just the name of the compound. And what I really want you to focus on is this column I've highlighted called brain plasma ratio. And this is where they're really searching to improve. So a, brain, a higher brain plasma ratio is better. So something over one is what their target is. That is, it's getting more into the brain than the plasma. And you can see from these previous compounds that were developed by Replogen, the brain, the brain plasma ratios are somewhat lower than the target of one, which is what Biomarin would like to achieve. So that is where they are right now. There are new derivatives being made. And we've tested a few of these, but I, I, I'm not exactly sure how long it will take before, before these will be subjected to the IND enabling studies. But we're very hopeful that, that the new com compounds will be just as effective as the old compounds. So I just wanted to review a few critical issues, again, with the use of HTAC inhibitors for therapeutics. And the, again, in the past five years, the data coming out has been essential for understanding the roles of individual HTAC isoforms in different neural functions. And it's also very important to identify which HDACs are responsible for the observed effects in the particular disease. And that is because the design of the subtype, subtype selective or specific HDAC inhibitors is really the way forward for these, for these types of drugs to go into the clinic. Again, we don't want to elevate the expression of every gene in the body. We don't want to target all of the HDACs. We want to find out which ones are most useful and then selectively target those. Another very active area of investigation is to identify the targets of HDAC. So we are doing this in our lab, looking at histones and target genes. And that is because we also we do want to know the knowledge of the precise mechanisms of actions. We know they elevate gene expression, but we really want to nail down what genes are being changed and how they're working. And finally, as BioMarin is really focused on looking at the drug properties, and this is because ideally these compounds will be delivered orally. The trial on HDAC uh, I-109 was an orally delivered compound. And this, the best way to, to do this is to improve, improve the bioavailability and the brain penetration so we don't have to worry about complex drug delivery. OK, so just a quick summary. We found that selective HDAC3 as well as HDAC1 and 3 targeting inhibitors are effective at delaying and reducing the HDAC HD-like symptoms in model systems. And in mouse models, we found that inhibition of HDAC3 was actually sufficient to improve disease symptoms, such as weight loss and motor performance. 
we found that these compounds do not show toxic effects, unlike the broadly acting compounds. We found that h 1 and 3 inhibitors can normalize the gene expression deficits associated with mutant Huntington aggregation. And in particular, we've been focusing on the UPS system and found that these compounds can reduce mutant Huntington aggregation. Clinical trials with one of our compounds showed safety and tolerability in Friedrich's ataxia. And we are hopeful that these results could pave the way for trials in patients with HD. Finally, my acknowledgments are my co-workers at the Scripps Research Institute, of course, Joel Gottesfeld, and um, my co-workers, Elena Aiken and Ben Tang, University of California, Irvine, Larry Marsh and Leslie Thompson have been instrumental in the screening process of these compounds, and Replicant Corporation, James Rushi and Vincent Jock were essential in developing the compounds after licensing from Scripps and our current our current company, Biomarinage Limited. Yeah. Okay, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Beth. That was a great review of, of HDAX. Um, I'm going to be hitting you up for some of those slides for sure. Um, if anyone has any questions, please put them in now. Uh, you can type them in and, and submit them to us. Um, we're happy to uh, try to answer them for you. Um, I, while these questions are, are flowing in, I'll get us started. Um, you know, you, you touched on specificity of, of, you know, there's a lot of different isoforms of HDAX, and the chemists are trying to work hard to get specificity around a particular HDAX, in particular maybe one M3. Do you, in my, do you think it's possible? Are, are they making headway? I know, in terms of developing a drug that's specific for HDAC1 over HDAC3, that my understanding is it's really tough to uh, develop a specific drug within a particular class, class 1 or class 2 of HDACs. So it, it turns out it's difficult to develop an HDAC1 selective drug that can get in the brain. So the chemists at Replogen have been able to make HDAC1 drugs, but they just don't penetrate the blood-brain barrier. It turns out it's quite easy to make an HDAC3 selective compound by adding a fluoro group on the end um, I, of one of those uh, bulky compounds. We have a scaffold, and what the chemists do is they change the moieties on either end, and they lengthen the carbon chain in between the two phenol groups. They could talk a lot about that. <laughs> I'll just talk about it briefly. But it turns out in one particular position of that scaffold, if you add a fluoride group, that for some reason really targets it to HDAC3. So they've been very, it's been very easy to take an HDAC1-3 compound and turn it into an HDAC3 compound. And that's what they've done with a bunch of their compounds and the ones that we're testing. One of the, one of the things you didn't mention is one of the data from your really exciting uh, paper from in PNAS earlier this year showing that I believe it was the for B compound had transgenerational effects. Sure, yeah. So we, um, I, did, I, was, I wasn't sure if I should go into that for this type of seminar because I really wanted to explain our HDAC program to people that maybe have heard about HDAC inhibitors but weren't sure what to think about them. And so that's why I limited it to more of our therapeutic effects and, and, our, and our approaches to get these compounds into the clinic. But what we had also studied was really neat transgenerational effects. So what we found when we treated our mice with OB was that we could not only improve the disease symptoms in the mice that were receiving the drug, but that these benefits were actually passed on to their offspring. So we looked at offspring who were transgenic for the Huntington's disease gene who had not been exposed to any drugs, but they were born from a father who had, and they actually performed much better than other mice who were born from fathers that were not treated with the drug. And we have ideas about what's happening, and we think that there's some crosstalk between different mechanisms associated with DNA methylation. So DNA methylation is another way that chromatin can become compact or open, and DNA methylation typically results in a compact chromatin and a reduced gene expression state, and we found that we could reverse that and um, promote gene expression of a few genes that we found that were altered in the offspring as well as, as in the, the parents that were receiving drugs. Very cool. Thanks. Um, in regards to the Frick's ataxia trial, can, 
you mentioned who who was the sponsor of that trial? Was it Repligen and? Uh, yeah, it was. It was Repligen. And they had a partner in Italy, and I don't remember the name. I apologize. Is it your understanding that Biomarin will now be hopefully taking that over? Friedrichs Ataxia. Right. right. So the work in Friedrichs Ataxia is much further along than the trials for Huntington's disease, and um, Biomarin is continuing to work on both Friedrich's ataxia and Huntington's disease. And they have a compound that they've already tested in Friedrich's ataxia model systems that they are proposing as an approved version of the 109 compound. And we have not yet tested that compound in the HT mice, but we are hoping to do that this year. Um, you know, this might be also tough to answer, but there's a question coming in of when do you believe that this will be in clinical trials for HD. Right, right. So um, just basing, uh, basing this answer partly on the trials I showed you with compounds such as valproic acid and phenylbutyrate. And these compounds were FDA approved for one condition, but they can be used for another indication, such as Huntington's disease trial or ALS or SMA. So we really are hopeful that, or we really will probably believe that the Friedrich's ataxia drug would move into trials faster or perhaps FDA approval sooner. But as soon as the FDA approves one of those compounds, if we've shown that it's effective in our HD mouse models, we really think that could fast track that into a clinical trial for patients. Great. Um, I have a question for you about the uh, gene expression stuff that you showed. It was pretty staggering the number of genes that were changed in response to your HDAC inhibitor. Was that after a single dose, or is that chronic exposure to the drug? Right. So that one was um, was after a chronic exposure, and we've also tried to do some time courses with selected genes to see how they change, and we certainly do see differences that change with after, let's say, three days of treatment compared to three months of treatment. But we certainly do also see changes happening after a single injection or three injections. There's no other questions here. We have a group here in, in the national office watching, watching along, Beth. Okay. Um, watching my black screen? <laughs> now it's black, yep. Um, so, no, I, that's, it was fantastic. Um, folks out there, if you have other questions, feel free to uh, send them along, and uh, we'll try to answer them. If, if I can, I'll, I'll pass them on to Beth, and we'll get your question answered. Um, but I just want to thank you again, Beth, for taking time out of your day, waking up so early to, to join us on the West Coast to present this uh, important topic, which hopefully yes, my will pleasure. Thank time you. in the clinic for HD. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, George. It's my pleasure to be here. We'll talk to you soon. Okay.